Good afternoon, everybody. Good evening, and thank you for being here. My name is Alok Chandra. I am the eldest son of the late Professor Satish Chandra. Um, and this is, as Sandhya was saying, the fifth Satish Chandra Memorial Lecture. The first one was he passed away in 1917 at the ripe old age of 95. 1917. 20. 2017. I'm sorry, we skipped a year, a century there. <laughs> Yeah, I'm still sometimes living in the 19th century. <laughs> um, and uh, the first lecture was held at the India International Center in Delhi. Uh, it was delivered by Professor Irfan Habib, uh, former colleague of my dad's and prominent historian. And the second year was in 2020. It was online, Zoom by Professor Ramila Thapar. Third was in 2021 by Manu Pillay. And 22 by a gentleman from... Uh, Dr. Rajiv Kinra from the University of Chicago, also on Zoom. So here we are in 2023, and I grabbed the opportunity of the lifting of travel restrictions. And and actually, Dr. Mithila Mukherjee had introduced Professor Irfan Habib at the first lecture in Delhi. So we took the opportunity of bringing her down from Delhi. And uh, um, Professor Mukherjee uh, is a professor of modern Indian history. Uh, she taught at the JNU uh, from 72 for 40 years. Also thereafter was the, chair, the chairperson, the head of the Nehru Memorial Library in Delhi. And uh, she has been the director of the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library. She has also been the visiting scholar at Duke University, USA, and at the Institute of Oriental Culture, the University of Tokyo and Chairperson of the Archives on Contemporary History at the JNU. She has published widely in the areas of agrarian history, peasant movements, social movements, and the Indian national movement. Her publications include India's Struggle for Independence, 1999, and India After Independence, 1947 to 2000, in 2000, both co-authored. So it takes me take great pleasure in introducing Professor Midhula Mukherjee. Um, thank you for coming down, ma'am, and look forward to hearing. Thank you, Alok. Uh, this is a great uh, honor for me to be invited to deliver the Professor Satish Chandra Memorial Lecture. I was uh, lucky enough to have known Professor Satish Chandra uh, for a very, very long time and till uh, the last days and remained in touch, close touch with him. In fact, he was one of the founders of the Center for Historical Studies of JNU um, in 1970. He was one of the first professors who joined there, along with Professor S. Kopal, Ramila Thapar, and Bipin Chandra. And he was responsible for setting up uh, the medieval section of the center. And I got to know him uh, as a young MPhil student right in 1971, when I was still a student and he was the teacher. So I known him in uh, very different avatars. Then, of course, for some time he was away from JNU because he uh, went to the UGC where he was first vice chairman and then chairman. So that was a period of about eight years. And then he came back and uh, joined the center again and was there till he retired. And uh, after his retirement, he set up a very fine institute called the uh, Institute for Indian Ocean Studies. And uh, this became a very vibrant organization which organized lectures, research, brought out a journal. And then I had the good fortune to be associated with him uh, in, in, in later on. Uh, as a member of the uh, governing body of that institute, he asked me to come and serve on it. So I had the opportunity of interacting with him on a regular basis because of that. Uh, I just want to say that uh, Professor Satish Chandra was one of uh, the uh, representatives of what was finest in our uh, scholarship. He was an outstanding historian, a wonderful human being, a true Renaissance scholar. His range, his knowledge was truly uh, phenomenal. 
and represented the most progressive trends of his age. He pioneered uh, many new areas of study within history. Uh, for example, he opened up the whole area of medieval Indian history of Rajasthan and brought a whole new dimension into the study of the Mughal period of Indian history. He was at Jaipur at the Rajasthan University for a few years in between after Aligarh. He was at Aligarh and then he was there and then he came to uh, JNU. And uh, I also want to share with you uh, a little bit about, you know, his spirit. This was when uh, he was already in his late 80s and had developed uh, quite serious health issues, especially relating to his kidneys were failing. So he had to go for uh, dialysis virtually every other day. So the day he didn't go for dialysis, he was at the Institute for Indian Ocean Studies at his office. But even when he was uh, in the dialysis in the hospital, if by chance you called up and, uh, you know, you'd say, okay, go ahead, and but I'm in the hospital. I'd say, no, no, sir, I'll call you tomorrow. I'll call you later in the evening. He says, what's it got to do? Dialysis got to do with my being able to interact with you. And he, that spirit, you know, which he had was fantastic. I interacted with him till he was well into his 90s and I was amazed. I used to go to him for advice on a number of issues. His mind was crystal clear. The way he could read through, I once, there was some legal issue on which I wanted his advice. So I took this brief to him and I said, will you go through it? And it was amazing. You know, in 15 minutes, he just scanned through it and knew exactly the essence of what was in it and, you know, gave his very sound advice. Till the end, he always stood up for causes which we, he thought were uh, uh, right, regardless of the costs that you might have to pay because uh, the p more powerful people were on the other side. And he, so therefore his, I think his life and his career and the way he lived that life is remains an example to us today when we go through troubled times and keep looking for sources of inspiration and courage. Professor Satish Chandra will always stand out. I would also like to mention that his wife, Professor Savitri Chandra, was also a professor at JNU. She was a professor of Hindi literature, and she too was an expert on the medieval period and had worked on the bhakti poetry and was a very recognized scholar in her own right, a very gracious uh, lady. And we were very lucky to have Professor Satish Chandra and Mrs. Chandra, and for a while their children also living on the campus, being part of the social life of the campus, which was very rich, as you can possibly imagine. So this, I don't want to pass up this opportunity of paying my personal tribute to an extraordinary uh, human being. I'll now uh, move to the lecture. Uh, as Alok has told you, uh, you know, very distinguished uh, scholars, uh, my very senior colleagues and teachers of mine have delivered earlier lectures. So this is for me uh, still an intimidating, uh, uh, you know, task. And nevertheless, I hope that I will be able to do justice to the subject. Uh, the subject is also intimidating, uh, no matter how much one explores the life and work of uh, Mahatma Gandhi, one always uh, keeps feeling more and more inadequate in, in one's own ability to understand, because the more you go at it, the more you realize the richness and the complexity of uh, his life and his uh, achievements, and one in fact, as I said, feel smaller and smaller as you get to know more and more. So that too is a very intimidating task, but I'll try and do whatever I can possibly uh, within the constraints of time. As uh, some of you might have seen uh, in the abstract, uh, the topic which I've chosen today is, uh, is India today the Swaraj of Mahatma Gandhi's dreams? 
And uh, there are, of course, I'm sure obvious reasons, which all of you can think of, why I would frame the uh, lecture in this way. But uh, I think uh, more than anything else, I wanted to first be able to share with you uh, Gandhiji's own vision in his own articulation of how he saw the ideal of Swaraj for which he gave, uh, fought all his life and for which he gave his life. So I will just uh, quote to you a couple of sentences from his writings in order to give a flavor of that and then go on to analyze uh, different aspects. Gandhiji gave expression to his dreams for Swaraj or independent India on many occasions in many ways. And I've just chosen a couple of them here. I quote, in 1931, uh, he said, the Swaraj of my dreams recognizes no race or religious dis distinctions, nor is it to be the monopoly of the lettered persons, nor yet of moneyed men. Swaraj is to be for all, including the farmer, but emphatically including the maimed, the blind, the starving, toiling millions. On another occasion, not very uh, much uh, uh, different in time, he said, it has been said that Indian Swaraj will be the rule of the majority community, that is the Hindus. There could be no greater mistake than that. If it were to be true, I for one would refuse to call it Swaraj and would fight it with all the strength at my command. For to me, Hind Swaraj is the rule of all people. It's the rule of justice. In today's talk, I will try to explore uh, multiple facets of Mahatma Gandhi's vision for India, especially his ideas and practice on religion and secularism, democracy and dissent, and violence and nonviolence. I will not be able to take up some very important aspects such as his vision of uh, independence and sovereignty, what that meant, his economic vision of equity and empathy for the poor, his struggle against caste oppression, especially against untouchability, his economic, uh, his views on the position and role of women, which is very, very important, and many others, because there's, otherwise I would just have to be saying a couple of sentences on each and moving on, and I don't think that would be meaningful at all. So I selected, and even that is not going to be easy, to, uh, to basically focus on these three areas. Of course, in the end, and all along, I'll also be suggesting uh, the question as to what to what extent have we been faithful to Gandhiji's dreams? Where have we failed him? And does the India of his dreams even remain an ideal? It may not be the reality, but does it even remain an ideal for Indians today? A little bit of the background of his life, especially maybe for the younger generation who may not be that familiar. The opening chapter of the story of Gandhiji's political life begins with the struggle of the Indian migrants, mostly poor indentured laborers in South Africa in 1893, when he was a young man of 24. He tried a variety of methods of protest in South Africa, which eventually culminated in the adoption of mass civil disobedience, or what he by then called Satyagraha at a mass meeting held at the Empire Theatre in Johannesburg on September 11, 1906. Incidentally, that was also 9-11. Many struggles and travails, including long jail terms, marked the rest of his years in South Africa, including very uh, tough jail terms. He returned to India in 1915, and till his martyrdom in 1948, he initiated and guided, along with colleagues and followers, an amazing variety of what he called Satyagraha campaigns. The repertoire of Satyagraha included, first and foremost, the nationwide struggles against colonial rule, beginning with the Rowlett Satyagraha of 1919, which was his first All India Movement, continuing through the non-cooperation and civil disobedience movements of 1920-22 and 30-34, 30, 
and culminating during the period of the Second World War in the individual civil disobedience movement and the Quit India movement, which involved the people in their millions. But it also included many struggles uh, uh, involving other concerns, such as the Champaran, the Kheda, and the Bardoli Satyagres on issues affecting peasants, the Vaikom Satyagraha on the issue of caste-based discrimination, the Rajkot Satyagraha for securing democratic rights in a princely state, the Ahmedabad struggle for the demands of mill workers, and countless others. Gandhiji's most important contribution, in many ways, was the fashioning of a strategy of struggle based on a complex understanding of the way power was exercised by the modern state. He developed it in response to the nature of the British colonial state, but it was found to be very useful in many different contexts, as I will uh, mention later. Why did the modern state find it relatively easy to crush violent resistance, but had no answer to nonviolent protest? This is the big question. Why has mass protest taken nonviolent forms, whether in India or Poland or South, Af South Korea, or in the erstwhile Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, or more recently in Hong Kong? These are some of the questions to which answers will be sought. I begin with a quote from uh, Gopal Krishna Gokhale, whom Gandhiji called his political guru, about how he saw Gandhi. Gokhale, in a famous statement, hailed Gandhi as, I quote, being without doubt made of the stuff of which heroes and martyrs are made. More importantly, he noted, I quote again, he has in him the marvelous spiritual power to turn ordinary men around him into heroes and martyrs. I argue, it was his success in devising the method which he named Satyagraha of turning ordinary people into heroes and martyrs that gave Gandhiji the ability to influence decisively the history of India and indeed of the world. For him, the heart and soul of Satyagraha was resistance. Resistance against injustice, resistance against discrimination, Resistance against oppression, all kinds of oppression, all kinds of injustice. And it encompassed a vast array of forms of struggle. Satyagraha could range from non-cooperation to returning of titles, that is, such as returning titles and awards, as in 1920-22, boycotting schools, colleges, as again, beginning with the non-cooperation movement, picketing foreign cloth and liquor shops, and it could also include civil disobedience in the form of non-payment of taxes, land tax, chokidara tax, a range of taxes which were refused, breaking oppressive laws by selling banned literature, making salt, which was contraband, it was a monopoly of the government, defying section 144. There could be a whole range uh, that could come within the uh, uh, compass of Satyagraha, going on a fast. The only limit was set by nonviolence. Nonviolence was not a method. It was a limit which defined the range of methods that could be used. For Gandhiji, Satyagraha, or truth force as he called it, was not an abstract philosophical concept but it was a weapon that was forged in the flame of struggle and sharpened on the whetstone of hard political practice. His basic weapon for the empowerment of the people, the masses, was the participation of the people in their millions in political action, which he called Satyagraha. He believed that if the masses were politically active, they could secure any goal that they desired. For him, nonviolence was important not only as a moral value, but because it enabled and necessitated the participation of the people. A nonviolent movement could only be successful if it had 
mass participation. And mass participation could only be secured if the movement was nonviolent. Thus ran the Gandhian dialectic. I'll give you an example from how he explained this just before starting his famous Dandi March, which was to begin on the 12th of March 1930, which ended at Dandi. He started from Ahmedabad, from his ashram. So two days before that, a large crowd had collected at the ashram in anticipation of dramatic events that were unfolding because he'd already sent his uh, ultimatum to the viceroy in typical Gandhian fashion, warning that I'm going to start a movement. It was never a secret. It was always an open affair. So two days before, a lot of people had collected at the ashram and Gandhiji goes out and addresses the people. And what does he say? He explains to them how nonviolence works. And I'm quoting him. Though the battle is to begin in a couple of days, how is it that you can come here so fearlessly? I don't think any one of you would be here if you had to face rifle shots or bombs. But you have no fear of rifle shots or bombs. Why? Suppose I had announced that I was going to launch a violent campaign not necessarily with men armed with rifles, but even with sticks or stones, do you think the government would have left me free until now? Can you show me an example in history, be it England, America, or Russia, where the state has tolerated violent defiance of authority for a single day? But here you know that the government is puzzled and perplexed. Please remember these two words puzzled and perplexed. Further explaining the power of nonviolent mass civil disobedience, he said, he continued, suppose 10 persons in each of the 700,000 villages in India came forward to manufacture salt and disobey the Salt Act. What do you think this government can do? Even the worst autocrat you can imagine would not dare to blow regiments of peaceful civil resistors out of a cannon's mouth. If only you will bestir yourself just a little, I assure you we should be able to tire this government out in a very short time. And this is what he demonstrated in movement after movement, how non-violent Satyagraha worked by placing the government in what you can only call a no-win situation. It immobilized the government by locking it in an irresolvable dilemma. If it did not suppress a movement that brazenly defied its laws, its administrative authority would be seen to be undermined and its control would be shown to be weak. But if it suppressed it, it would be seen as a brutal anti-people administration that used violence on non-violent agitators. In either case, it was the government that suffered a blow to its prestige and the movement which witnessed a swelling of its ranks. I quote a British civil servant by the name of C.F.V. Williams, who was a Madras presidency civil servant. He was based there. This is how he expressed the dilemma in early 1930 when the civil disobedience movement, the Dandi March movement started. I quote him. He says... If we do too much, Congress will cry, repression. If we do too little, Congress will cry, victory. That's the dilemma. So what do we do? Gandhiji himself pointed out how non-violent struggle was the choice of the brave and not of the weak. As early as Hind Swaraj, which is 1909, he had written, I quote, What do you think? Wherein is courage required in blowing others to pieces from behind a cannon or with a smiling face to approach a cannon and be blown to pieces? Who is the true warrior? He who keeps death always as a bosom friend or he who controls the death of others? Believe me that a man devoid of courage can never be a passive resister. It was, I unquote, it was this courage of militant nonviolence, of satyagraha, that made heroes out of ordinary men and women. 
enabling them to defy a mighty empire on which the sun never set. Gandhiji's emphasis on nonviolence was also linked to his deep conviction that you could not separate the means from the end. In fact, he believed that the means were bound to shape the end. You could not hope to create, a build a humane, caring, inclusive and free society on the shaky foundations of violence. The gun that is aimed at the enemy can easily be turned to cow down a comrade with whom you now disagree. If walls were not to come up between peoples, the methods chosen for resolving differences and conflict must be such that they ensure justice without breaking down communication. The Lakshman Rekha of nonviolence made this possible. The answer certainly did not lie in more violence, in better methods of mass destruction, he argued. His answer to the, when the atom bomb was used, the tragedy of the atom bomb, when the US used it against Japan in 1945, Gandhiji famously said, the moral to be legitimately drawn from the supreme tragedy of the bomb is that it will not be destroyed by counter bombs, even as violence cannot be by counter violence. Mankind has to get out of violence only through nonviolence. Hatred can be overcome only by love. Counter-hatred only increases the surface as well as the depth of hatred. We could apply this very easily to what's going on in Israel-Palestine conflict today. In subsequent decades, when Gandhiji was no longer with us, his path was chosen by other great movements in India and other parts of the world. In his own land, grassroots movements of various kinds have found themselves inevitably drawn to the methods of Satyagraha. For example, all those who have been fighting and are fighting communalism and for secularism have inevitably turned to him as an icon and inspiration. The environment movement, whether it is the Chipko movement in the Himalayas or the Narmada Bajau, Bachao Andolan in central India, have all identified themselves closely with Gandhian methods and ideals. Many sections of the women's movement, as well as the more recent struggles for the deepening of democracy, such as the movement for the right to employment, right to information, right to education, and the right to food, right to forests, all bear a similar imprint. In the United States of America, Martin Luther King consciously adopted Gandhian principles in the struggle of the black people for civil rights. In Europe, the peace movement and the green movement were built on similar lines. In South Africa, the movement against apartheid was inspired by Gandhiji's example. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission set up in South Africa after the end of apartheid evolved as a truly Gandhian institution which promoted reconciliation rather than revenge, but on the basis of truth. Lech Walesha, or Wawensha, as you like, the legendary leader of solidarity in Poland, showed to the world how Gandhian technique of nonviolent mass action could be effectively employed in the struggle for democracy and civil liberties. Poland's example had illuminated the path for many other movements that have struggled for democracy in the twilight years of the 20th century. In the former Soviet Union, in East Europe, in the Philippines, in South Korea, these great movements for social transformation developed further what Gandhiji called the science of Satyagraha. The dominant motifs were mass public rallies in city squares, often involving millions, which turned into days-long sit-ins, candlelight vigils, offering of flowers to soldiers, and festooning battle tanks with banners and streamers. These were the weapons of revolution. It is evident then that diverse movements for human dignity and freedom in many different lands continue to find meaning in Satyagraha and are able to adapt it according to their specific context. I'll skip a bit. I now go on to the next uh, uh, subject, which is uh, 
on the subject of democracy and civil liberties and Gandhiji's vision uh, about that, his understanding of that. Gandhiji's critique of Western civilization has tended to obfuscate the fact that the movement he led was aimed at establishing a modern parliamentary democracy with rule of law, adult franchise, guaranteeing fundamental rights of freedom of expression, association, etc., as embodied in the Karachi Resolution of the Congress. Gandhiji never said he wanted to go back to some mythical Ram Raja in which just kings ruled over obedient subjects. His Ram Raja was a metaphorical expression of a just society, free of exploitation, not a political model of a Hindu monarchy. Democracy and civil liberties were a major concern for Gandhiji. Let me begin by quoting him to show how deep his conviction was for civil liberties and democracy. I'm quoting for a, from an article which he wrote in his journal called Young India in 1922 in January at the height of the non-cooperation movement. I quote, we must first make good the right of free speech and free association before we make any further progress towards our goal of Swaraj. We must defend these elementary rights with our lives. That's how important the struggle for civil liberties, he says, is. You must be willing to even sacrifice your lives for it. I quote from another article which he wrote soon after. Liberty of speech means that it is unassailed even when the speech hurts. Liberty of the press can be said to be truly respected only when the press can comment on, in the severest terms upon, and even misrepresent matters. That is true freedom. Freedom of association is truly respected when assemblies of people can discuss even revolutionary projects. The only line that he drew was that of nonviolence, as will become clear in the next quotation that I read to you. I quote again, civil liberty consistent with the observance of nonviolence is the first step towards Swaraj. It is the breadth of political and social life. It is the foundation of freedom. There is no room here for dilution or compromise it is the water of life. So I think the imagery is very important because there is no life without water. And civil liberty is like water, so essential to life. He also says it cannot be diluted. Water cannot be diluted. You can't say, I give you this freedom, but I put restraints on it. I put limits on it. You cannot dilute it. If you do, then it's not civil liberties. Just one tiny quotation also from Nehru to show how there was absolute identity of views between them on this subject. Uh, because Nehru was also one of the biggest fighters for civil liberties. I just will give you one, uh, one, one very important quotation, 1940. The freedom of the press does not consist in our permitting such things as we like to appear. Even a tyrant is agreeable to this kind of freedom. Civil liberty and freedom of the press consist in our permitting what we do not like, in our putting up with criticisms of ourselves, in our allowing public expression of views which seem to us even to be injurious to our cause itself. That is how freedom and civil liberties were, were defined. And how did Gandhiji put these ideas into practice? How did he treat those with whom he had ideological and political differences? It's not just a question of uh, faith in civil liberties, but also about defending people with whom one does not agree. Defending your opponents, defending people with whom you may have sharp differences, not just allowing them to exist or to speak, but actually coming out and defending their right to speech. I'll give you two examples. One is a little broader than just Gandhiji, but it's a very interesting example. It's from 1929. You might have heard of the Meerut conspiracy case. 
The British government was very worried that left and communist forces were becoming powerful. So they picked up those whom they thought belonged to the extreme wing of the left and hoped thereby to divide the anti-colonial struggle, the national movement. They arrested 32 people, among whom there were trade union leaders, political leaders, including three British communists who had come to India to help in the organization of the trade union movement. They were put up for trial in Meerut, a small town in UP, and very soon the Meerut conspiracy case became a national cause. The British, as I said, thought that they would isolate the left-wing activists convict them and send them for long terms to jail and thereby finish off the movement. Instead, what happened was that the top leadership of the Congress, Jawaharlal Nehru, M.A. Ansari, M.C. Chagla, took up their defense, became their lawyers. Gandhiji himself visited the communist prisoners in Meerut jail to show solidarity with them just as Jawaharlal Nehru had visited Bhagat Singh and his comrades, with whom they differed in the methods, in jail to show solidarity with them. Speeches of defense made by them in the court, that is by the communists, in which they talked about their ideals were carried in, not the left-wing newspapers, in the major nationalist newspapers of the day. And this was how, for the first time in fact, ordinary Indians became familiar with communist ideas because the major nationalist newspapers carried these speeches by the communist leaders. Another example I want to give you is of the Quit India movement. 8th of August 1942, Gowalia tank, Bombay, there's AICC meetings being held and thousands of people have collected despite the Defense of India rules, which was like an emergency legislation. Uh, in order to support this movement. Gandhiji is going to be delivering the famous Quit India speech. So there's a lot of excitement in the air. Everybody knows some big movement is about to break out. And he, it was here that Gandhiji presented the resolution that would give him the authority to start the movement. A few communists who were members of the All India Congress Committee, as they were allowed to be, got up and objected to it. They said that the international, their understanding of the international situation was different and they felt that going against the British government would harm the international cause against fascism. So they opposed it. But the atmosphere in Bombay at that time was surcharged in favor of the Quit India movement. Naturally, some kind of hostility towards this group could be expected. So what does Gandhiji do at this open meeting? He takes the floor and he gives a speech in which he says the following, I quote, I congratulate you on the resolution that you have just passed. I also congratulate the three comrades on the courage they have showed in pressing their amendments to a division, even though they knew that there was an overwhelming majority in favor of the resolution. And I congratulate the 13 friends who voted against the resolution. This is his resolution. In doing so, they had nothing to be ashamed of. For the last 20 years, we have tried to learn not to lose courage, even when we are in a hopeless minority and are laughed at. We have learned to hold on to our beliefs and the confidence that we are in the right. It behoves us to cultivate this courage of conviction, for it ennobles man and raises his moral stature. I was therefore glad to see that these friends had imbibed the principle which I have tried to follow for the last 50 years and more. What was he doing with this statement? Gandhiji was throwing a protective cover over the opposing communists who were obviously going to be the butt of ridicule and could even be subjected to physical attacks by the crowd. Such was the mood in favor of Quit India. By coming out in support and by admiring their courage, he stood up for the idea of right to dissent, a crucial component of democracy and civil liberties. In fact, he always emphasized that democracy is about dialogue and not a question of numbers or majorities. Democracy means you must listen to your opponent and to those who differ with you. 
This is how the best of our national leadership and Gandhiji himself inculcated in the Indian people the notion of democracy. It is not just about a parliamentary form of government. It's not just about elections. As Nehru said repeatedly, in the final analysis, democracy is about dialogue. It's about whether you are willing to listen to your opponent or not. Time is short and I come to my final point. Gandhiji on secularism and communalism. Gandhiji is a wonderful example of a person who was deeply religious but totally secular. Another one, by the way, was Malana Azad. What is fascinating is that both Savarkar and Jinnah, the creators of Hindu communalism and Muslim communalism in this country, were agnostic, at least if not atheist. And those who defended, who were believers, were the ones who were the staunch fighters against communalism and for secularism. What were his views on religion, its role in public life, its relationship with, my, with morality? These are all very important issues. He saw himself as, in fact, a reformer of the Hindu religion, rejecting those elements which did not pass the test of rationality. He said that again and again. Everything has to be judged on the basis of rationality. He specifically rejected scriptures which espoused untouchability and the inferior status of women. He was not known to ever visit temples or observe any religious rituals. And he called himself a Sanatani. All this controversy we have going on about who's a Sanatani. He rejected all rituals, all belief in the caste system. He often said, sorry, uh, his daily prayer meetings, which were open to all and had recitations from many different religious traditions. He often said that religion was a tree that had many branches, which represented different religious faiths and that all faiths had the same message. And that's the reason he said, I don't believe in conversion because I believe all religions are saying the same thing. So why should you convert? Stay with the one in which you've been born. When he found that his statement about not wanting a politics without religion was being misunderstood, he clarified again and again that by religion in this case, he meant morality and not any denominational religion. So he used the, the, the term, the word in different senses, but when he saw it was being misunderstood, until today it is quoted wrongly, he's misquoted on this. What he, what he meant by religion in that sense was ethics and morality and not a denominational religion. He made lifelong efforts at Hindu-Muslim unity against the communal divide and against communal violence. So many examples from his work, I can't go into them, but the Khilafat movement where, in which he brought Hindus and Muslims together in the non-cooperation movement, the Gandhi Jinnah talks which he tried soon after coming out of jail, uh, after quit India, his refusal to accept the idea of partition, and then his mass campaign against communalism and communal violence from November 1946 to January 1948. Gandhiji's commitment to about which I'll talk a little later. Gandhiji's commitment to secularism and opposition to communalism was as absolute as his faith in nonviolence and democracy and civil liberties. As early as 1931, he had said, it has been said, no, I already quoted that, so I don't need to repeat it, that it has been said that Indian Swaraj will be the rule of the majority community, that is the Hindus. Uh, I would refuse to call it Swaraj. But the, the quotation which I will move to is the one which, when he gave the call for Quit India in 1942, that famous speech I already referred to at the Gowalia tank, this is what he said. It was a very long speech. And one of the things in which he says in that, he makes this unequivocal declaration, I quote, important for all of us to remember this, put it up on our walls and read it every day. Free India will be no Hindu Raj. It will be Indian Raj based not on the majority of any religious sect or community, but on the representatives of the whole people without distinction of religion. 
He further says in the same speech, I quote, those Hindus who like Dr. Munje, he was a Hindu Mahasabha leader, and Sri Savarkar, believe in the doctrine of the sword, may seek to keep the Muslims under Hindu domination. I do not represent that section. I represent the Congress. Congressmen will sacrifice their lives in order to protect the Muslims against a Hindu's attack and vice versa. It is a part of their creed and it is one of the essentials of nonviolence." Unquote. In November 1947, when the clamor for a Hindu Rashtra was very loud, that's when the communal elements were having a field day because of partition and uh, the you know, transfer of populations and the communal violence. They were shouting from the housetops for a Hindu Rashtra. Gandhiji's answer was, I quote, the state was bound to be wholly secular and the state of our conception must be a secular democratic state. Again, repeating the same thing in a different way, he said, if a minority in India, minority on the score of its religious profession, was made to feel small on that account, he could only say that this India was not the India of his dreams. I wonder what is happening to him wherever he is. However, more than his statements, it is his action on the ground from November 1946 to his assassination in January 1948, which demonstrates his unshakable faith in the necessity for religious harmony and his determination to fight against the commun what he called the communal monster. I begin with Gandhiji's departure for Noakhali, a remote district in East Bengal, in early November 1946. As it is not possible to tell the story of these years with Noakhali left out. Gandhiji had, with unerring instinct, sensed that the battle for India's soul would be fought and won, not in the broad avenues of New Delhi, but in the by lanes and winding paths of Noakhali, of Bihar, of Calcutta, and Punjab. That is, wherever the communal monster surfaced, he had to go. As you all would remember, direct action, which had been called by the Muslim League in August 1946, resulting in the great Calcutta killings, followed by the terrible news of the communal carnage in Noakhali, which is a district in East Bengal, a rural district, a Delta district, was sufficient indication that the toughest challenges still lay ahead. The ideals for which so many had sacrificed their all seemed to be slipping out of reach at the very moment of victory. At the very moment of independence, it seemed that there was going to be a disaster. Torn with doubt and racked by despair, that his methods of nonviolence and love, rather than violence and hate, had failed, he threw everything he had into the balance. He, in, he, he said, I quote, it is to demonstrate the efficacy of that way, that is the nonviolent and way and the way of love that I have come here. If Noakhali is lost, India is lost. With his small band of devoted comrades, I think barely 10 or 12 people, he went into the villages of Noakhali, not for a visit, not for a tour, not for an on-the-spot survey, preferably from the air, as leaders are wont to do, but to stay as long as it was necessary. And he stayed on for four long months, from the 6th of November 46 till the 4th of March 1947, in this remote corner of India. It is difficult even today to comprehend how the most revered leader of a vast country in the throes of difficult negotiations for transfer of power, charting out its path to independence, could spend such a long time almost out of the reach of, its, of his own movement. By the way, he used to be visited by the leaders in Noakali. Even Nehru went there to consult with him. 
as they said, the capital of India was wherever Gandhiji was. When he lived in that village in Vardha, that became where everybody had to gravitate. He spent the first two weeks visiting the villages and towns in the affected area and meeting large numbers of people. He then settled down in a village named Sri Rampur and spent the next 43 days there. He soon sent off all his associates except two, his typist, Parsuram, and Nirmal Kumar Bose, a professor, who was his interpreter, thus depriving himself of even basic care and small comforts. No family member, no attendant was to stay with him. As if this was not enough, he followed it up with a padayatra in which, in which he did not then sleep for more than one night in any one village. Every day he shifted to a new place. The satyagrahi was trying, by his own suffering, to melt the heart of the opponent and win him over. He was also sharing through the crucifixion of his flesh, the pain of the victims and expressing the torture of his own soul. Thus, when broken glass and human excreta were thrown in his path to dissuade him, as, it, as they were, his answer was to remove even his simple sandals and walk barefoot through those thorny paths. Akla Cholo Re, Tagore's apt song, which means walk alone, if no one walks with you, walk alone, was often on his lips as it seemed to have been written for him in that context. His method to the terrorized Hindus, because this was a Muslim majority area and Hindus were in a minority, they were the victims. His method, his message to them was, very interesting, shed your fear, go back to your homes. To the women who were afraid to wear Sindur and bangles in public, as these were markers of their religious status, he said, Wear your shakha, wear your sindur. Assert the right to your own culture. Since the focus of the oppression was an obliteration of religious symbols, the resistance too had to take the form of assertion. He repeatedly said he has come not to offer consolation but to give courage. He refused to accept the Hindu Masabha's demand that Hindus live in a separate area. This would lead to ghettos, he said and defeat the whole purpose of his work. If we are divided, if we start living separately, then what's the point of a united country? He was also not in favor of cases against perpetrators of violence being dropped, as the guilty must accept punishment, he said. It is difficult, even today, to comprehend the blazing courage that Gandhiji demonstrated in the twilight of his life. There are few images more moving than that of this frail 77-year-old man who could have all that anyone could want for the asking, walking barefoot through the blood-stained villages of Noakhali, where his people had descended to the lowest depths, staying only for one night in one village, sleeping in the huts of the poor, searching for an answer, crucifying his flesh, in yet another experiment with truth. He then went on to Bihar, where there had been large-scale communal violence in October 1946. And even though there the violence had been quickly brought under control by the efforts of Jawaharlal Nehru, who headed the interim government in Delhi, who quickly marched his entire cabinet to Bihar in order to control the uh, violence. And there was a Congress ministry Yet there was a clear awareness that restoring amity and getting the Muslim refugees back into their homes was a slow and tough process. Gandhiji reached Bihar on 2nd of March 1947, straight from Noakhali. He visited the affected areas and his message was, Hindus must repent and own up to their guilt. What had happened, he says, what he said, the word was pap. It was a sin that Hindus had committed. It must be atoned for. He also told Hindus they should contribute money for the relief funds, as this would prove that they were genuinely repentant. His efforts bore fruit, as there were reports of the guilty surrendering to the police and of refugees returning from other provinces. But there was a very poignant 
incident that happened during his tour of the villages in Bihar. Gandhiji had seen so much violence. He was stoic. He went through all this without breaking down. But at one place in a village in Bihar, he came across a library, which was a repository of old manuscripts, which had been destroyed. And when he saw that, he could not contain himself. He sat down on the edge of the embankment of a well, which was near him, and he broke down completely. Because he said, this is proof that civilization has come to an end. The burning of knowledge was something that to him was, represented the absolute degradation to which human beings could reach. On the 15th of August, 1947, he was in Calcutta on the request of Surawardi, the Muslim lead, lead, leader who was the premier of uh, West Bengal, who had refused to help Gandhiji when he was in Noakali. But now Surawardi requested him and said, Gandhiji, to prevent a Holocaust happening on the 15th of August when power is transferred and uh, Calcutta will come into the Indian side and Muslims will be massacred in revenge by the Hindus, you please be here in Calcutta. Gandhiji agreed on one condition, that they will live in the same house, they will sleep under the same roof. And they found a house in a Muslim locality. And he stayed there with Surawardi and walked through the streets of Calcutta holding Surawardi's hand. And in this city where 5,000 people had died in communal violence uh, just a year earlier, not a single drop of blood was shed not a single incident of violence occurred. But in Delhi, a big riot had broken out in the beginning of September, within 20 days of independence, because huge numbers of refugees had come here and they were being mobilized by uh, the communal forces to push out the Muslims from the old Delhi area and occupy those houses. So at least 2,000 people died in the communal riots in Delhi in the first week of September. And Nehru reached out to Gandhiji, asking him to come there to help control the situation. So Gandhiji diverted himself from, he was on to Punjab and Northwest Frontier Province. Uh, he wanted to, in fact, go into Pakistan even. But he came to Delhi and stayed there till his assassination. And these months that he was in Delhi uh, are again proof of the fact of how his presence uh, was such a, a great help in bringing this volatile situation under control. Nehru, in letter after letter that he writes to chief ministers, talks about how there is a danger of this fire spreading over whole of northern India. And it's a very, very dangerous situation. And it takes all the power of the state as well as the moral power of the national leadership and particularly of Gandhiji to retain India as a secular nation. We all know that just two weeks before he died, he went on a fast unto death on the 13th of January, 1948 to secure Hindu-Muslim harmony. And he gave up the fast even though he was in extremely bad physical condition, only when all representatives of all the communities and all the parties came and gave it to him in writing that they would not promote disharmony. We can also never forget that he was martyred to the cause of secularism. The Hindutva Brigade, which planned the conspiracy, and the assassin who gunned him down, believed that he was the chief obstacle to the setting up of a Hindu Rashtra after partition. And they were right. As I just showed you, from October 1946, when communal violence began to spread, he devoted all his energies to fighting this problem and became, in Mountbatten's famous words, a one-man boundary force. Mountbatten wrote to him and said, what all our armies are not able to do, you can do. You are a one-man boundary force. His martyrdom at the hands of a Hindu communalist was the pinnacle of self-sacrifice 
and had a cathartic effect on the whole nation, ravaged at it as had been by sectarian strife. Don't forget that at least half a million, if not more people had died and many more had become refugees in this uh, period, which can only be compared to the, to the Holocaust. And that how with his, with, with the, uh, with the, his assassination, uh, it was as if there was a cathartic, it had a cathartic effect. And this violence came to an abrupt halt. It was as if somebody had given a divine command and in one stroke, the atmosphere changed. Those who had indulged in communal violence felt guilt and remorse. And those who had even held communal thoughts or sympathized with communal ideas felt that they had somewhere participated in the loss of the greatest Indian. As Nehru said, the greatest Indian after the Buddha is what he called Gandhi. For 10 long and difficult years in the life of the newborn nation, there were no incidents of communal violence. The first communal violence that we see comes almost around 1960. So at least a decade of communal peace was made available at this very difficult period. And that is why his life and his martyrdom continue to inspire and empower those who are striving towards the India of his dreams. Thank you. Um, did Mahatma Gandhi's death prevent Hindutva wave and was Hindutva now inevitable in India? I don't quite understand the connection you're making. Are you saying that because it was uh, sub you know, suppressed or it was yeah, yeah. at that time. Therefore, it's emerged yeah. is, later. Is it, no, I don't see is, it. is it because... No, uh, I don't see it like that at all. Okay. No, I think that uh, what it was successfully fought against in the early years after independence, uh, before independence and in the years immediately after independence, uh, where I've already talked about the role of uh, Mahatma Gandhi, but I think... Equally important was the role of uh, the government, Jawaharlal Nehru and his uh, colleagues of all uh, kinds, I, you know, uh, who put up a very determined fight against the Sardar Patel, for example, after Gandhi's, Gandhiji's assassination, uh, uh, banned the RSS. And uh, all, almost around 25,000 uh, RSS workers were put in jail and they stayed in jail for about one and a half years till they gave an assurance that they would now become a cultural organization and no longer take part in politics. Uh, and successfully at the level of politics, uh, you know, they were, I would say, delegitimized. The greatest proof is the first general elections, which are held in 1951-52. End of 51, beginning of 52. So now if we just count the number of years, let's say 47 August, and now we are going into 51. So about four years later. So there's been enough time now for these forces to try and recoup, you know. I mean, after Gandhi's been now dead for more than three years and all that. But they were roundly and soundly rejected by the electorate. The... Uh, Hindu Mahasabha virtually dissolved itself after Gandhi's assassination because Savarkar's name was, you know, associated uh, with the suspicion that he had been involved and he was actually put up for trial. But ultimately, in the trial, he was exonerated. But such was the uh, public revulsion at that, that the Hindu Mahasabha actually didn't dare uh, even uh, seek power for a long time. And dissolved itself, uh, effectively speaking. They remained uh, thing, and a Jansang was set up as an alternative. A new name was given to the same forces because, but so that, because people uh, were, would not, you know, want to be associated with uh, 
an organization that had the taint of Mahatma Gandhi's assassination on it. So you can imagine what the mood was. I mean, for it, I'll give you a very interesting uh, example from a completely different kind of source. Godse, the assassin, you know, he was put up for trial, as you know, and then obviously convicted hang because he was caught <laughs> red-handed. So there was no doubt. He writes in his uh, uh, statements, which he gives after the after he's been uh, put in jail, he's, he, he was actually very upset because he thought that people in India want a Hindu Rashtra and that by killing Gandhiji, he would become a great hero. But he became a hated person and in outside, there were riots against in Maharashtra against Brahmins because Brahmins were thought to be the backers of the RSS. And his family had to go into hiding. Anybody associated with him, in fact, Apte's girlfriend left home. Apte was the other, uh, you know, conspirator. She, she completely disappeared and was never found again because she could not take the odium off. And she never knew that Apte was in this conspiracy or even that he was communal. But such was the, you know, uh, atmosphere of... Uh, the, the mood was completely <laughs> pro Gandhi and anti the Hindu Rashtra Walas. And in the general elections of 1951-52, they got uh, 10 seats out of 450 something and 6% of the vote. And there were parties like Ram Parishad, this, that and the other small parties. So in a free voting, you know, people showed that they were not for it. So it wasn't a question of, you know, your question kind of implied that something was pushed under the sort of surface and then it erupted. I don't think it was that at all. I mean, we could go on discussing this. Yeah. Why it happened is a different story. <laughs> uh, Ma'am, my question uh, pertains to uh, why... Uh, Passive resistance worked so effectively against an alien regime, but uh, it seems to be uh, totally uh, ineffective uh, when faced with homegrown majoritarianism. Okay. I think the difference is not alien and indigenous. I think the difference is between a regime which at least has pretensions to being democratic engaging in dialogue, responding to people's uh, movements, responding to opposition. I think that's the crucial difference. The British, with all the, you know, uh, uh, ultimately the power resting with, uh, obviously the force was very much there. The army was there, the police was there to impose British power. British power. But yet the structure that they had set up in India had the formalities of a democratic system, partially. So we call it semi-democratic, semi-authoritarian. It's neither one nor the other in a pure form. It's different from, it's not a question of good or bad, it's a question of understanding the particular kind of political structure which the British adopted. Their compulsions were that they were a democracy at home. So they had to always justify their rule in India to the British people. So they had to have semblances of, you know, the a democratic structure, voting, as you know, there was not adult franchise before independence. Even after the 1935 Act, only 13% of the otherwise eligible population had uh, the vote. There were very limited powers that the assemblies and the councils uh, had. So, but at the same time, there was that uh, concession to a democratic structure. So what I'm saying is that the crucial issue here is whether the regime you're facing has this. Now, I also extended my argument to saying that, and this is something we need to work on more, because if we see how Lech Walensha uses it in Poland, and then we see how nonviolence is used as part of the what the so-called you know revolutions 
the Velvet Revolutions, as they are often called, in East Europe and in the Soviet Union, how that entire structure begins to fall in front of nonviolent opposition, then we've got to ask ourselves further questions, you know, as to what is it about a modern state which makes it vulnerable to this kind of resistance. See, none of these are absolutes. This doesn't mean that some regime somewhere, like, it's quite possible that Israel will wipe out Gaza to the point that virtually hardly anybody is alive over there. It can happen. And yet, you know, this doesn't mean that the only path of resistance is a violent resistance. In fact, one of the arguments that's being made today, I'm sure you've read it, various people are making it, that despite whatever were the injustices and the rightness of the Palestinian court, Hamas has only harmed the cause by following the method that it has, you know. So these are the, this is the kind of complexity of the argument, you know, about where nonviolence can be effective, how it can be effective. Uh, for example, uh, you could ask me, China, how will nonviolence be effective against a regime like China? My answer to that will be, can violence be effective? What happened in uh, the students, uh, the, um, sorry? Tiananmen Square. Yeah, Tiananmen Square. People ask after that, you know, what, what do you do in a situation like that? It was a non-violent resistance by the students and they were massacred in cold blood. Very right. But the, 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 ans the answer or the further question is, suppose they had actually used violent methods, would they have succeeded? Okay. So I think these are very complex issues. There are no pat answers. There are no easy answers. Even Gandhiji never said when he was uh, alive that in every situation, you must only use nonviolence. He did not. Even in India, when the Quit India movement happened, a lot of violence occurred. And the British kept on asking him to condemn that violence and he refused. And finally, the only statement which he made was, the violence of my people was only a reaction to the leonine violence of the British state. So it was you who produced the reaction. He refused to condemn the violence. Because during Quit India, it was like what we later call the, like the emergency kind of situation. Because uh, in the Second World War, the government had imposed the Defense of India rules. No civil liberties were allowed, no meetings could be held, nothing could happen. So in inevitably, also what happens is when there is no scope for democratic nonviolent dissent, dissent does tend to get pushed into violent channels and that's what happened. So people spontaneously, but here also it was very interesting. As I said, it's not a black and white thing. The people who, who did use violence in, in the Quit India movement, they still had certain principles. There you can see Gandhi's impact. Like they would, they would derailing trains, but never a, a passenger train. They would derail only goods trains. They never attacked, the violence was never uh, against the British or the opponents, whoever they might be to harm them physically. The violence was against symbols of British authority. Destroy the railway stations, destroy the telegraph system, the railway system, okay. And means of communication. So violent means were used, but human life was sacrosanct. In fact, it is, uh, it is a miracle that in Eastern UP and Bihar, where the Quit India movement uh, attained mass proportions. And for 15 days, there was no British authority that existed. This whole area, huge area, East, whole of Eastern UP and Bihar, huge, huge area. There were hardly, and there were many British civilians in that area, many British civilians and otherwise in that area. Hardly two or three examples of British people being attacked, though they're rebels and the ordinary people had all the opportunity to use this to 
uh, attack the British, but no, they did not physically attack the British. You know, so it's again, as I said, it's, I mean, I don't have, didn't have time to go into all the dimensions, but just to introduce a few ideas so that one can start thinking about uh, the dynamics and not think in, you know, simple terms of violence versus violence. When, when, uh, when the Chinese delegation came to uh, see Gandhiji, late 30s, and the Chinese were already embarked on their own revolution, which was a violent revolution. So people around him asked, Gandhiji, aren't you going to tell them that they should follow the path of non-violence? And he turned around and said, he said, who am I to interfere with the people who have already embarked and chosen a certain path? They are well advanced on it. Who am I to tell them what they should do or should not do? What I am telling you is for my situation, for what is appropriate here. I am nobody to tell the Chinese as to what they should do. They know what they should be doing. You know, so again, it was his understanding of violence, non-violence. I mean, the other thing, for example, I think we all know that he said the most important thing is resistance. If you cannot resist non-violently, resist violently. The more, more important is the resistance, not... Don't use non-violence as an excuse not to resist. I had a sort of a two-parter, if you don't mind. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I uh, had a sort of a two-parter. Uh, one was uh, with specificity to uh, Gandhi and Nehru's views on democracy and civil liberties, right? Nehru's commitment to civil liberties was well known, uh, which is why it's sort of confusing uh, why Nehru embarked on the journey that produced the First Amendment of the Constitution uh, yeah. in uh, February 1951. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the second part uh, of that would be uh, Gandhi's views on himself of the strong versus himself of the weak. Right. Uh, when it came to 1946 and 1947, uh, Gandhi is quoted to have said that he thought that India and Indian protests were ahimsa of the strong. And uh, he realized that India's protests were ahimsa of the weak. And he was left quite disheartened when he saw the communal violence that uh, happened post-independence. Uh, could you talk to both of those points, please? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, as far as the first question is uh, concerned, uh, by the way, uh, since we're talking about Nehru, some of you may find uh, something interesting to do in your spare time when you're getting bored. Look for a site called Dismantling Nehru. <laughs> you will have a lot of uh, amusing time can be spent. It's a site in which anything that can be found critical of Nehru is written about. And what, this is one of the things they're written there, by the way. Your question. Very <laughs> interesting, but that doesn't matter. But you could just enjoy it about how there's a whole enterprise that goes on to discredit, uh, you know, and delegitimize Nehru. So it's a, it's a full industry that goes on over there. I mean, you know, you know what all happens. He's a Muslim, he's a womanizer, he's this, he's that, so everything everything wrong that can happen. He's responsible for partition, he's responsible for this debacle, that debacle, etc. But coming more seriously to your question, I think one has to understand the context. I don't think that one example is a proof that Nehru did not believe or he gave up his belief in civil liberties. Think of the situation after independence, you know, the pressures under which the Indian state was functioning. What I described to you, Nehru is writing uh, three or four months, uh, I think in January is when he writes finally, he says, I think we've managed to control the wildfire, which they were afraid with the refugees coming in and all that, stopping them at Delhi, that otherwise it was going to spread over the whole of North India and that was going to be a disaster. And the other thing was that uh, this, this, uh, the amendments, you know, you also know that uh, when he brought in Zamindari abolition and all that, then the, lots of cases were filed in the courts by zamindars, by landowners, by princely uh, kind of elements, you know, jagirdari elements, in order to stop. So there again, he had to bring in, uh, you know, uh, amendments, which obviously could be seen as interfering with the judiciary or taking away certain fundamental rights, if you thought right to property was a fundamental right. But then again, look at the situation. I, I, it also it meant that land reform could not be implemented. It meant the millions and millions of poor people who were waiting to get tenancy rights, who were waiting to get some you know, sustenance, would have to be sacrificed. So 
obviously it's a balance, you know. But I think that there is, uh, yeah, I would also say that what is uh, flawed about this method of argument is when we take one line from somewhere or one incident or one action and then generalize. When we are analyzing, we have to take the whole story. We have to take Nehru's entire, uh, you know, period of prime ministership and see where he, uh, what would be our assessment. Here is a man who, I mean, today it would be a shocking that prime minister actually comes to parliament and sits there the whole day. But Nehru actually sat through all debates. He, there was, uh, I recently I looked up something, I was, I was looking up something in Nehru for a vote. You know, when did he face a vote of no confidence? And I was amazed. This was his first time that he faced a vote of no confidence. I think in 62 or something like that. Four days long the debate was and he sat through the entire debate. And at the end of it, he answers virtually point by point, line by line to every criticism, including the most vicious one, which has been uh, made and, you know, argues back, of course, and gives his own point of view, but takes it so seriously. And this is when the Congress at that time, as you know, had an overwhelming majority. So this vote of no confidence was, it had no chance of success, of course. It was only meant to bring up a debate, you know, Loya and all, had a lot of fun during that debate, calling Nehru all kinds of names and all that. But he took it all in his stride and answered back point by point, you know. You also probably know the stories where he uh, would, uh, if, there was, if there was a debate on something, he introduced a certain measure and nobody's criticizing, he would get up and say, okay, I'll tell you what's wrong with it. You know, that this is so important that to know contrary points of view, that this notion that you are the repository of all wisdom, all knowledge, you are always right. I think this is something we learned from Gandhi and Nehru also learned from Gandhi a lot on this because Gandhi's whole thing was that, I mean, even his stand on against the death penalty, for example, or against violence, taking human life, because he said, do I know the whole truth? Can I be sure that this person is guilty and I, dis I am right in taking this person? Suppose I find out five years later that I was wrong and this person is not guilty. Can I give him back his life? I can't give him back his life. So do I have the right to take the life? So this relativity of your own position, you know, you are not a beholder of, I mean, a holder of absolute truth. You're a seeker after truth. He says experiments with truth. He never says, I have the whole truth. I think that's very important. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Thank you for this wonderful evening. Uh, my question is, and I'm glad you brought about the current um, climate that we're in, right? When there is an aggressor and there's um, a state that's affected, our first observation is always, how are they going to respond? So and we spoke about there is room for, it's not black and white, even when you're speaking about nonviolence, how do we effectively respond? So when your opponent is raining down missiles on you, and is there something as responsible violence or you know, responsibly setting an example that, hey, I'm not going to behave the same way, I'm not going to wipe out countries irrespective of um, just because I want to make a statement and I want, I want to be responsible for my people, but can we pick up some doctrines and exemplify them or tweak them in a way that you are putting out a statement, but you're also responsible about it? I'm confused about um, your question. But what somewhere you use the word responsible violence. Right. So I, I didn't... Can you explain what you mean by that? So I would like to answer you, but... I'm not getting the point. Uh, you are faced at a situation of war, right? Okay, war. War. Okay. Uh, in the current, maybe Russia, Ukraine, or even right, Palestine right, and right. Um, Israel. We do know from the doctrine that right. nonviolence cannot be the response to right. nonviolence, but right. there's also room to respond effectively. Yes. 
how do we draw that balance and how yeah. do I pick up yeah. and kind of make a statement that I'm not acting like my opponent, sure. but I'm also making out a responsible statement. And that's why I said responsible violence okay. where... Now I understand. Yeah. I'll give you an example from Gandhi. We forget that when uh, the Kashmir occupation started, you know, the whole Kashmir issue started with the Pakistanis sending in those so-called raiders, uh, tribesmen, who are actually soldiers dressed as uh, frontier tribesmen. And then the whole issue of whether India could come to the help, the Maharaja reached out, and uh, then the accession took place, and then India sent in the troops and all that. This is end of uh, October 1947. So Gandhiji is very much alive. He's very much there. He's in Delhi. He's in the heart of things. Do we ever have a statement by him which says India should not go to the, not use violence to defend uh, the Kashmiris or, you know, whatever the Indian state did, whatever Nehru did, Patel did. It was, it was with his, with his full knowledge and full concurrence. So obviously, uh, see, as an individual, as, he's not acting as a prime minister, right? But somebody who is the prime minister or somebody who is a defense minister will have to act and he jolly well understands that. I mean, I mean, Mahatma Gandhi is no saint. Okay, he's a hard politician. So he understands politics to the core. But he's also ethical. He's also a visionary. He's also a utopian. So I think, you know, we often tend to mix up many ideas of his which are utopian ideas and there's a place for utopia. Just as you may not achieve an ideal, but the ideal is still important. You know, so there are many things which he says, which is, he's not like, I give you the quotation about the atomic bomb that we can't answer, you know, bombs with bombs. And, and here also he would say, we should try to talk to them. We should, and by the way, Nehru did the same all the time that, he had to fight, he sent the armies. But what is he actually doing? He's continually trying to engage Pakistan in talks. In fact, there is so much calumny heaped by Hindu Masaba and others or Nehru at this point also because they say, these guys are not behaving properly. They are not, uh, you know, that in Pakistan, the killing of Hindus is still going on. So we should push uh, Muslims into Pakistan and and for everything they say we should attack them and just as Gandhi would do Nehru is always saying that is no answer war is no answer we have to negotiate so he engages in long grueling negotiations with Lyakatali the prime minister this is the Bengal problem the, the Bengal border I mean I can't go into the story it's a very complicated story but at in the at the risk of uh, being called pacifist and not protecting uh, India's interests and Hindu interests, he continues to try for peace, you know. But at the same time, he has to defend physically also. So, of course, you know, you have to do that. Uh, well, good evening, ma'am. Uh, here, here, on this side. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, no problem. <laughs> Thank you so much for the talk, ma'am. <laughs> Um, as per my understanding, when we talk about Gandhi and modernity, uh, there is a bit of a dilemma, like especially considering his views on industrialization or the self-sufficient village economy. So ma'am, can we actually say Gandhi was a critique of modernity or where do we place Gandhi in the context of modernity? Gandhi is a critic of the excesses of modernity. Remember his uh, quotation that uh, the earth has enough for everyone's needs, but not enough for everyone's greed. Right? Now, uh, you know, uh, so what is he criticizing? Uh, you also know his famous answer once somebody asked him, what are your views on Western civilization? And he said, uh, what's that? And it doesn't exist kind of thing. So he had many, you know, quips. But at a more serious level, yes, just as within 
the Western tradition. Also, there are many who we call them romantics and all, who were critics of Western industrial civilization, right? So I think we have to distinguish between what exactly we are talking about. Words get used loosely, right? He's not against the West. Some of his best friends are Westerners. Charlie Andrews, for example, his bosom friend who lived with him in his ashram, Mira Ben, Madeline Stage, she was the daughter of a British admiral. So by no means, Amrit Rajkumari Amrit Kaur, she was the daughter of the Kapurthala family and from that branch which is a Christian and she had been brought up in England. So she was a thoroughly westernized young woman who comes and then spends her, you know, till he's alive, she, spends, she becomes his secretary, lives with him in his ashram. So he had all kinds, very good relationships. In his South Africa days, some of his best friends were, uh, you know, Jews, Christians and all that. So I think we have to distinguish between. So he's not a critic of the West. He's not in some simplistic way an indigenous by any means at all, you know. His critique is of the excesses of the industrial civilization and the industrial revolution, we all know what they are. He also had a utopian ideal of a self-sufficient village-based uh, economy and society. I don't think he ever imagined that it was going to happen in his lifetime or some or the next few lifetimes. It's an, again an ideal. That's why I said you have to remember and think in terms of utopia. So that ideal gives you a vantage point from which you can critique. All right, that's what utopias are for. The utopian knows that you're not going to reach that utopia. But the worth of utopia is to look critically at what's wrong with where you are. Otherwise, you will be completely engulfed in your present. You know, so to imagine something different, uh, you have to first give yourself that space and then look critically at what might be going on. That's one. Yes, certainly he had. Uh, he changed over time. His ideas also developed over time. Like, for example, uh, one of the things which he said about modern industry, uh, in the 30s, earlier he said no industry, etc., etc. But then gradually, as he could see, and he had to talk in terms of what was practical for the kind of after independent, what India was going to become. He said all big industries should be owned by the state. Now you can say this is an idea that comes from socialism. But Gandhi espoused it. He said, I see the need for industry, but then it must not be in private hands. Because then it can be exploitative. So it should be owned by the state. He also had the notion of trusteeship, which I'm sure you know about, where he said, which is made fun of because saying that he imagined that these uh, philanthropic industrialists are one day going to become, you know, uh, so altruistic that they're going to give away their wealth. It was not that. He is again setting up an ideal before industrialists saying, why don't you try and think of your wealth in terms of a trust that has been reposed on in you and which you use for the welfare of the people. You know, so he's he's he also addresses himself at various levels to the now, to the future, to people with whom he's working. So he does work with industrialists, does he not? Right from the days of his first ashram in India, when he comes to India, sets up his ashram in Ahmedabad, who was funding him? Merchants and industrialists. How will how could he set up that ashram? And in fact, if you might remember, there was that crisis where an untouchable family had been admitted to the ashram by Gandhiji and there was a protest in the ashram. And the inmates of the ashram said, we are going to leave if you're going to allow this untouchable family to live here. And the donors to the ashram said, we are not going to. So Gandhi said, it doesn't matter. I'll dismantle the ashram, but the untouchable family will stay here. But I don't mind, let it dry up, let it, and it actually happened that there was no money coming. And then suddenly out of the blue, some donor came, left, later it was found, it was Ambalal Sarabhai. Now Ambalal Sarabhai is a person against whom Gandhiji launched the textile mill strike in 1917, right? So that he was a donor didn't prevent him from struggling against him. 
and yet retaining that what I talked about, the openness, the dialogue, the relationship. And Ammalal Sarabhai's sister, Anasuya Sarabhai, came and uh, worked with the workers against her own brother. You know, another member of the family, Brudula Sarabhai, became Gandhi's comrade, you know, and worked for the rights of women. So it's, you know, again, <laughs> I think, as I said, the more you study, the more you realize how little you know, because there's so much complexity and richness. And there are no simplistic answers. So I would not even try to give absolute answers. I could only give you some pointers which may help you understand. Thank you, Dr. Mukherjee. The lecture was fascinating. And you have, with your deep knowledge and understanding of Mahatma Gandhi and his times, in his own words, you have brought to us alive his concept of Swaraj in his day and times. Of course, the, whether India today represents the Swaraj of Mahatma Gandhi's dream is a question which I think you would need to answer in another lecture. Mm -hmm. So we have to bring you back again, maybe the next time. Um, and of I, course, I, my idea is to raise the question so that everybody answers. Yes, so yes, everybody would need to imagine themselves as to, you know, whether <laughs> India today is what Mahatma Gandhi dreamt of as a Swaraj thing. But Dr. Mukherjee, thank you for your time, your knowledge, sharing with us at this time. Thank you for coming down all the way from Delhi with Dr. Aditya Mukherjee, who's also a historian and uh, gracing us with your presence. Thank you too to the um, Bangalore International Center for enabling us to host this uh, fascinating evening. And thank you not at all to Santhya, the young lady who's been running around uh, facilitating matters. Mm -hmm. Lastly, of course, thank you everyone for taking the time out to attend what is essentially a very arcane subject in today's day and times. Thank you. Thank you again. Good night.